Um, yeah, thank you for, for joining today. Um, CMQ4 has to do with climate change and uh, impacts of climate change on uh, physiology of organisms. We've had two previous webinars on this topic, one on birds and one on amphibians. So today, Cameron Barrows will, will dive into uh, reptiles, our next taxa, and um, his presentation will talk about determining vulnerability assessment, sensitivity to climate change, physiology, and identifying pot potential refugia for reptiles. Um, Cameron is a research as um, associate ecologist for the Center of Conservation Biology at the University of California, R Riverside. And um, want to uh, remind everyone that we'll hold questions to the end in case we do have to continue the unmute uh, version of this. And we'll hold questions till the end. And you can either, um, at the end, uh, um, raise your hand or unmute yourself and uh, uh, give them verbally or put them in the chat box. So, um, Victoria, how are, how are we doing? On the on the recording end. Okay, um, I'm not sure if it's working. Um, it never confirmed it to me, so it's up. I guess it's up to you if you wanted to go ahead and start. Okay. I can try it again. Well, it's almost ten after, so um, let's go ahead and proceed. So, um, Cameron, are are you ready to go? I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. You. Well, welcome everybody. I see there's a couple of familiar names on the list of participants, so welcome to you, couple. Um, let's see if we can get this, there we go. A lot of what I'm gonna to talk to you today is in a recent publication, and I just wanted to bring your attention to this. I'm, I'm gonna talk about a couple of publications along the way, and all of those will be available to you. All you have to do is send me an email, and I'll pass these along to you. This particular publication is a collaborative effort with the National Park Service, and if you look at the list of um, co-authors here, Josh, Michael, Kristen, and Mitzi are all with Joshua Tree National Park, and Michelle and Kathleen are with the University of California, so it was a very collaborative team working together. Josh represents really the vegetation aspect of this, and, and I'm not gonna really spot, speak much to vegetation, I'll mention it a little bit, but the project itself really looked at all biodiversity within the park, and so just to, to give you a perspective, if you wanna get back and, and look at the publication, you'll see that it balances, especially vegetation and reptiles, but other um, taxa as well. I was asked to restate some of these critical management questions, and so here they are, and I highlighted the um, aspects of this that I thought were the most important. They seem to be a little bit on the wordy side, but you can see that what species and ecological processes are sensitive to climate change and can be effectively monitored to indicate the overall effects of these stressors on ecosystem habitats and species, thus helping managers detect, understand, and respond to these changes that would be critical management question number two, and number six is what species of amphibians and reptiles um, are likely to experience negative changes due to future changes in climate, fire regime, water availability in the southwestern deserts. And those are the two that I'm gonna specifically address with my presentation today. I was also asked to at least very quickly mention that climate change is happening, and I, I don't think I'm gonna go into it in a lot of detail here. Um, I think everybody on the phone at least has seen the evidence, and probably most, if not all of you, accept that we are experiencing a warming um, climate, and at least in the desert southwest, it is not only warming, but getting drier as well, and, and that 
drier is probably more of concern to biodiversity than warming itself. So this is important, and this is sort of the launching place for most people to talk about climate change, but I, I don't think it's important to look back a little bit and look at the last relative million years or so of climate change. And it's important, I think, to, to look at this and say climate change, even if the causes are different, is not anything new. Climate change has, at least in the last million years, we've had it about 10 ice ages and about 10 warming or interglacial periods. And the important part of this is that even though there were massive extinctions during this period, and the, you know, the North American Pleistocene megafauna essentially was more or less wiped out by these various um, climate change events, but the species we see today are survivors. And, and so in one way or another, they have physiological or behavioral or some other mechanism that they've been able to survive each of these climate change events. And so I look at the climate change a little bit more optimistically than a lot of my colleagues do who are essentially forecasting massive extinctions. And I'm sure massive extinctions are going to happen, but I also like to think that there are opportunities to protect a lot of the biodiversity we have today and those opportunities are based on the fact that these species have done it before um, in their evolutionary past. I'm gonna, this is going to seem like a digression, but I like to give my audience a sense of place and, and also talk about the levels of biodiversity in reptiles overall in the southwestern United States and in, in northwestern Mexico. And so this is a, a paper that um, some colleagues and I did um, a couple of years ago, and it was really catalyzed by me visiting Big Bend National Park where I forget where it was, but there was some place there that said that there was more species of reptiles or more species of reptile, um, lizards there than anywhere else in the United States. And I thought, well, that's an interesting statement. And I wanted to explore that and say, well, first of all, is it true? And second of all, is there any reason for that? And so some colleagues and I looked at basically national parks or um, man in the biosphere reserves or refuges that where there was really good um, documented species lists for lizards in particular. And if you look at this map, the hottest, hotter the color, the more species of lizards there are. So those red circles that you see have 30 or more species of lizards. The um, orange circles are about 27 to 28, 29, somewhere in there. The yellow circles are in the mid-20s. Um, the green circles are the high teens and up to about 20 or low 20s. And then the blues are below 60. 17 or 16 species. And, and so even though Big Bend has a lot of species of lizards, it's not, by no means is it is the, the high point or the, the highest biodiversity in, in this region. These high biodiversity areas then pre present some interesting questions about how did they survive past climate changes. So just a little bit of background here. We described a circle around the center or centroid of each of these national park or conservation areas that was 50 kilometers in radius. And we used 50 kilometers. We looked at the areas that we had done our own research and found that 50 kilometers seemed to be about the breaking point where you had a leveling off of biodiversity. I think if you go out beyond 100 kilometers, maybe 200 kilometers, you, you obviously start getting more and more, but then that didn't seem to be ecologically or from a management standpoint very meaningful. But right around 50 kilometers as a um, radius around these seemed to make the most sense. And then what we did was then say, well, what about um, the similarity between the sites? And so the if you look at the um, how large or dark these arrows are, it means they are more, they have share more species between them. And so you can see that there is a Chihuahuan desert 
region that is quite distinct from all the others, and they're, they only really share two or three lizards with all the rest, I think. Um, leopard lizards and side blotch lizards might be the only two. I mean, there may be one other in there. And then this is Big Bend right here. But these two sites down in Mexico have an extreme level of biodiversity. Um, this is Cuatro Cienegos, and this is an area called La Laguna, which is near Torreon, if you're familiar with the um, central portions of the Chihuahuan Desert. There's also the Mojave Desert, of course, the um, Great Basin Desert, and the Sonoran Desert. And this is classically how they're defined geographically. But when you start looking at these arrows, it actually suggests that there's something else going on. The Chihuahuan Desert makes its own unit, and there's no question about that. The Mojave Desert, slightly larger than was previously defined. And the Sonoran Desert, and we don't have any points for the Mexican part of the Sonoran Desert because there are no national parks or biosphere reserves down there, so we weren't able to have access to any species list. But I have a, my making the assumption that um, the Tucson um, Saguaro National Park area has a greater similarity down here. But otherwise, the only real similarity is to Oregon Pipe and um, Cabeza Prieta area. And that similarity isn't all that strong. But there's this other area which has really high similarities, which is essentially the Baja Peninsula. Um, and it could either be referred to as the Colorado Desert, which is generally just this area right in here, but otherwise the entire peninsula has a much greater similarity to itself, and that extends all the way into California with some connections over here to the Cabeza Prieta and um, Oregon Pipe area. Again, it's a little bit of a digression, but I wanted to give you a, a, a sense of place and understanding why we are working in the area we're working in that these areas do have fairly high biodiversity, in some cases extreme biodiversity. The highest site overall was this site right here, um, and I'll highlight it here. This includes part of Joshua Tree National Park. Um, this is the Santa Rosa and San Jacinto Mountains National Monument, and this is Anza Borrego Desert State Park, which is the la largest state park in North America. And that circle, that 50-kilometer circle, is essentially that. And so this is the focus of our area. And, and as I show you maps as we go on, you'll see that the, some of the maps extend beyond this to a certain extent. But this is why we picked this particular area and why we wanted to understand, first of all, why there's such high biodiversity here and whether climate change itself would have an impact on that biodiversity give you just a, a little bit of a fr an additional frame of reference. Um, we have the Salton Sea right here. And up until about this area, all of that is below sea level. In fact, as, as many as 70 meters below sea level in some cases. So this is very low, low, low um, areas. And then we have s several peaks in this area and, and just off the circle in this area that are in higher than 3,000 meters or more than 10,000 feet in height. So we have extreme topographic diversity. Um, in Joshua Tree, we only get up into about um, five, 6,000 feet. But down in the monument area and even down in Downs of Borrego, we have extreme topographic diversity. And I think that's part of the um, reason for the biodiversity. But also, if you think back to the maps that I showed you before, this is the Mojave Desert, and this is at Baja California bioregion. And so Baja California, even though we think of it down in Mexico, really extends all the way up through this area. And so we end up having three different species of fringe total lizards, which is probably the only place on the map where you can, within that 50 meter or 50 kilometer circle, find um, those three species or any three species of fringe total lizards in the same circle. And in one day visit all three of them. Um, there's two different species of collared lizards. There's, I'm only showing four here, but there's probably five or more different species of night lizards. And then there's a whole host, and I'm not showing them all here, of Baja endemics that occur within this area. I could add two or three other lizards as well. So the high biodiversity is, to a large extent, to this juxtaposition of ecoregions but also due to the high um, topographic diversity that we have here. 
So there's that sense of place. I also like to deal with conceptual models, and, and it's going to be a little like watching cartoons, and uh, just bear with me. But I think it helps us all understand where we're coming from when we think about climate change and what that effect is going to have on biodiversity. So in this case, you can see there's a gradient um, from left to right or right to left. And then the polygon that I showed there is the distribution or the range of a particular species of reptile. And in a typical year, you would have, and, and for all of these, yellow is good. Um, you would have high reproductive success within the center of that range and probably less reproductive set success at the extremes. But if it was a particularly wet year, you would expect more um, reproductive success at the drier, warmer end. And if it was a particularly hot, dry year, then you would have high reproduct higher reproductive success at that cooler and wetter end of that distribution. And those of us that go out and actually look at these things, that's exactly what we see. The concern, of course, is if it gets hotter and drier, that, and it continues to be hotter and drier, eventually we lose the ability, for, or those species lose the ability to reproduce within their current home range. And their, um, that climate envelope, that area of preferred temperature and, and moisture that they need to survive is going to occur someplace else. Now, for um, birds and um, dragonflies and butterflies, that probably doesn't represent too much of a barrier. They can just fly there. They can get there. But for reptiles and for small mammals and for most plants, this becomes a real concern because their ability to disperse is very limited. Um, and certainly within the time scale, if we're talking about climate change, for them to actually get to that um, new climate envelope that they could survive and reproduce in is highly unlikely. And so this is a real concern for Actually, most biodiversity, if, we, and if you take birds out of it and you take some of the flying um, insects, most other, and I, I'll include large mammals, so um, deer and mountain lions and things like that, but most other small mammals, reptile, all reptiles, and most other plants really don't have the ability to make these long distance um, dispersals, and they are not, they don't really know where to go, and so they're going in all kinds of directions, and most of their dispersal opportunities are going to end up with um, extinction, essentially. And so we look at this and say, okay, this is a real problem, but then we look back at these centers of biodiversity that I mentioned already, and they made it through the climate change events that we've had in the past, so how did that happen? So another way of, another potential scenario is they just basically rafted with the climate envelope as it moves to cross the gradient. And that works okay as long as climate change is a really slow process occurring over multiple, multiple generations. And I think that there is a perception that past climate changes were slower and that their current climate change is very different from that because it's happening quite quickly. But recent evidence indicates that that those past climate changes, at least some of them, were actually just as fast as what we're experiencing here. And, and here's just a, a series of papers that describe that. And so not only is our current climate change happening very quickly, but past climate changes, at least some of them, happened quite quickly as well. And still these species were able to survive. And so, again, we have to then rethink the model of how species adjust to climate change? How do they um, survive these climate change events that have happened in the past? So instead of thinking that they have to go from one place to the other and they somehow miraculously get there, um, and if they don't, we have extinction, another way of looking at that is to say, well, at least in some areas, in the, and especially areas with high topographic complexity, that shift in the climate envelope isn't going to be that great. And in fact, there is overlap between current, the current preferred climate envelope and the future um, envelope that will exist 
as a result of climate change. And what's important about that is that overlap area, this area right here, is then what we refer to as a climate refugia. And these climate refugias are where the species can occur today and in the future. Um, they don't have to move. They don't have to disperse to get there. And from those climate refugia, they can dis um, disperse to the rest of this new climate envelope and, and, and occupy that larger habitat. So this, if we knew where these climate refugia were, are, and, and, and can then prioritize those, those become very high priorities for conservation and management. So we have areas that are outside the distribution, current distribution and fu future distribution of these species, and we can say, at least with respect to those species, they have relatively low um, conservation priority, but these refugiums would be the highest, and, and this is what we really have to protect, but also protecting where they're potentially going to be going. And even though they're leaving certain areas, I think if we take the longer view, we should view those as places where they should go back to as climate change oscillates back and forth, which at least on a geologic time scale it's going to happen, and, and so we should think about conservation priorities from that perspective. So that was a very long introduction to getting into what we're going to talk about or what I'm going to talk about today. These conceptual models are important to give us an idea on um, how, we're, how climate change is likely to impact biodiversity. And, and I think that's important both for us to understand but also as we communicate to people who are not scientists so they can understand more um, graphically and, and ge geographically how we should deal with climate change from a conservation standpoint. But we also need to get validation for these conceptual models and say, well, is this really the way the world is working and, and with respect to at least to these species that can't move um, tens of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers to find new habitat as it's created when as climate change progresses? So we're going to look at a couple of different things. One is identifying which species we use as indicators, um, something called viability assessments, which I'll explain, um, talking habitat suitability models, I'll explain that as well, how we use those to create or identify monitoring stations, um, creating a monitoring structure that is sustainable, which is a, a real critical compo um, component that I'll talk about and developing robust protocols, and finally starting to collect the data. So first of all, identifying which species to use as indicators. Our team is pretty familiar, familiar with the region, and so we had our own ideas about what species we should be looking at. And, and we didn't want to just look at species that were very, what we thought were going to be very sensitive to climate change, but we also wanted to look at species that we thought were going to be quite resilient and robust to climate change. And the reason for that is a couple of reasons, but the primary reason is that climate change isn't the only thing that's going to affect these species. There's things like wildfire and invasive species and other things that are happening that may be synergistic, synergistic with climate change. They may be independent of climate change, and they're going to have effects. And so we need to um, include species that might be sensitive to these other stressors, but not so much to climate change. So we can tease out what, when we do see changes in distribution, whether that's a climate change effect or whether it's something else going on. We also polled um, what we considered were the experts in plants and animals of various types to get their ideas and, and their insights to what species we should include. And we did that, and, and I think that's important or to get their ideas, but it's also important to get their sort of buy into the process and, and feel like they're part of the process. So this isn't this um, conceptual design and monitoring design that is happening in a vacuum, that we're actually in, including the larger um, community of scientists and naturalists and managers to get their input as well so that we get their buy in. Once we did that, we started with something called um, viability assessments, and a lot of you might be familiar with these. This is something that has been promoted to a large extent by the Forest Service, but the National Park Service has um, also started using it as well. 
and it's what I call species-based in that we look at all these individual species and we look at the literature, we look at what other people know about these species and we go through a set of questions looking at the literature and say, are they going to be sensitive to climate change based on what other people have studied and what they've understood from physiology or distribution or behavior in areas that might be your management area, in this case the Joshua Tree National Park, or they might be someplace completely different. And that's why I call it species-based. It's not really um, based on a management unit. It's based on the broader distribution of the species. And so we um, identified the species and we created a questionnaire. And this, um, well, here's some citations for looking at um, viability assessments. Um, these are Forest Service documents or publications from Forest Service employees. And um, it gives you a good basis if you are interested in this to, to get an idea, plus the publication that we use, which we explain it in some detail as well. But you end up with a questionnaire, and in our case, 25 questions, and I'm only showing the um, first of three pages of questions to give you an idea of what we had to go through. And this, I, I think when I first looked at this, I thought this would be easy. We just sort of go through it. But first finding the literature, reading the literature, going through each question, it took at least a day or two for every species. So this was not an insignificant time commitment to do this. But we did it for each of the species and gave them a score and then ended up with a ranking. And again, we did both plants and reptiles and birds, and, and, and this gives you an idea. But from this, the species that are at the top of the list are those that were the most sensitive to climate change, and those at the bottom of the list were the least sensitive. So you can see pinion pines, night lizards, fence lizards, black brush. Um, coast horned lizards, Joshua trees, they're all considered, based on this analysis, very sensitive to climate change. The ones in the middle, it's, we don't really know. The ones at the bottom, things like verdans, desert iguanas, brittle bush, um, creosote bush, burrowing owls, we think are going to be more resilient to climate change. Um, because I'm supposed to be talking about reptiles, we focus a little bit more on that right here. And you get an idea that, okay, the night lizard based on the score, the top score they could have gotten, or the worst score if you want to look at it from the standpoint of being vulnerable to climate change was 25. Um, the best score would be a negative 25, and you can see that none of them, or very few were in the negative range. Even the desert iguana was somewhat vulnerable, but not very much so. But again, yucca night lizard, fence lizards, um, the coast horned lizard, and desert tortoise rate the highest in terms of their vulnerability, whereas the iguana, spiny, desert spiny lizard, desert horned lizard were the least um, sensitive all the way up. And then the chuck wallows and tree frogs and toads were somewhere in between. One of the values of this is not only does it give you some idea of what, um, based on the literature, we should expect them to how they or whether they should be resilient or vulnerable to climate change, but it also identifies mechanisms for climate change. And so when we go back to the managers, the land managers, and we see these are, we see the changes happening and we, say, we talk about what they as managers might be able to do to mitigate or buffer against these changes, we can look at those mechanisms and see what the manager might be able to do to help the species from the worst impacts of climate change based on those mechanisms. The other tool we used were these habitat suitability models. And there's a lot of these sometimes. They're called um, niche models is another name for them. But habitat suitability models is really the term of art that most people are using these days. There's a lot of methods you can use. A lot of people are using Maxent. Uh, it's a free downloadable program. Um, we used something different that was a, um, a different algorithm that was developed actually with um, a professor here at UC Riverside um, called uh, Partition Mahalanobis. And a lot of other people are using that because the statistics are pretty um, transparent. We, you, you really understand, it's pretty easy to understand how these um, um, numbers that you put in are, are changing the distribution. 
Essentially, they are both species and place-based in that you're collecting points from your management unit, the area that you're interested in, and these are points that the species is known to occur. And based on that, there's an assumption that those points have unique characteristics of climate and topography and soils um, that define the niche or the range of suitable habitat for that species. And then by putting those points into the model, it then gives you a map, a model that eventually looks like a map that shows where those kinds of conditions occur throughout the distribution of your management unit. And that gives you an idea of first where to look for the species, but it also enables you to then, given that their climate is part of the model, to then change the climate parameters and add a degree, add two degrees, add three degrees to the model and say, well, where, were that, where will that niche or that area of suitable habitat occur in those warmer conditions? And so that gives you an idea of to predict where the species might occur in the future. So this is an example, and um, this is for creosote bush, and this is one where we thought it would be very resilient to climate change, and, and in fact, based on the habitat suitability model, it looks like it's going to be very resilient. It, um, the yellow here is where it occurs today. The red is where we expect it to occur at the worst case climate scenario, which is a three degree increase in summer temperatures. And, and summer temperatures are not expected to increase as much as winter temperatures. So a three degree increase in summer temperatures would be definitely a worst case scenario. This is um, centigrade temperature. And so the areas that are, if you look kind of the, in this case, kind of a salmon or orange color are the refugia. They are both where the species occurs today and where we expect it to occur in the future. These darker red areas that I admit are a little bit hard to, harder to see is our new habitat areas. So for the most part, except for the very lowest elevation habitats that creosote currently occurs in, it'll occur where it occurs today. And so most of its distribution today is still going to be its distribution in the future. I've kidded the National Park people that they ought to change their name from Joshua Tree National Park to Creosote Bush National Park, because that's really the dominant vegetation of the park and will be going into the future. They don't like that idea, but I don't, and I don't blame them for that. Here's the pinion pine, and you can see that it has a very broad distribution within the park right now at the higher elevations, but in the future, very, very small and arguably not able to sustain a population there at all. And that, again, is very close to what the vulnerability assessments said as well. So you can see um, that for the most part, they are com moving completely outside of their current distribution. This is where you have to assume a miracle because there are, is very little in the way of refugia existing here. Um, this is a concern, and this is something where, as a manager, they might want to consider things like assisted migration or other types of management to maintain the species. But within Joshua Tree, it looks like very little, if any, um, of this species will be able to sustain itself in a worst case scenario. This is the Joshua Tree itself, and this is um, a somewhat concerning situation. Again, these are refugia areas, so we're able to identify some pretty significant refugia. About 10% of its current distribution are refugia. These out here are new habitat areas. Um, there was a study that was conducted, I think, in 2011, or published in 2011, um, by Kenneth Cole and others, who suggested all Joshua trees in California, or almost all Joshua trees in California, would be extirpated by the end of the century. And that's when I was kidding the part that you, they might want to think about changing their name. But before they do that, let's look at it um, in a more refined basis and look specifically at the park rather than looking at the broadest distribution of Joshua trees throughout their range. And when we looked at it on a finer scale, we were able to find these refugia 
And this is an important point that um, scale is critical to identifying refugia when you deal with these larger scales. So when Ken Cole was doing this, I, I forget whether his scale was one square kilometer or four square kilometers, but within that scale, it was very difficult to identify the, the finer topographic features and climatic features that were associated that, with that that would result in refugia, whereas in fact, at this finer scale we use, which was 180 meters by 180 meter um, cells, we were able to find quite a few refugia sites. So one of the important aspects of this is that we need to validate this. We can't just say, okay, the model says this, so you should go out and, and protect this area because the model says so. We need to find some way of validating it. And the modelers have various statistical ways of doing that, and I think that that is a valuable exercise. But as an ecologist, I think that we have to go out on the ground and come up with biological reasons for validating these. And so one of the things we did, um, and this is a series of models that we did before this particular exercise. So the models aren't exactly the same, but they're a, they illustrate what my point here is that this is the top left corner here. This is the um, current model for Joshua trees. It's slightly different from the other one that I just showed you because we used some different variables and had different points that we had to put into it. And this is with one degree increase in summer temperatures, and you can see the reduction there. One degree is about what we've had so far in this region, and so the question is, to, if the model says this is the current distribution, these are pretty long-lived um, organisms, the Joshua trees, they can certainly live a couple of hundred years, and their, their distribution is closer to this than it is to this. So how do you validate that biologically? And so what we did is we went out with citizen scientists and we said, let's look specifically for seedlings and um, very small seedlings. And so we looked for Joshua trees that were less than a foot tall and then modeled that distribution. And then, so that's what this lower right picture is. And you can see that the current distribution of reproduction in Joshua trees is very similar to the model distribution at a one degree increase in temperature, which is exactly what we've had up until this point. So that's a really good validation for a biological validation that these models, at least at this level, seem to be telling us what we need to know about the distribution of these species. And this was published by myself and Michelle um, a couple of years ago, and, and again, these are papers that I can make available to you if you are interested in looking at them. So let's get into the reptiles themselves. Um, this is the coast horned lizard. This is the current distribution and the model distribution. And you can see that when we do that three degree increase, there is really just a very small area of refugia here in the park. And in fact, most of this out here is new habitat. It's not refugia. There's a few refugia. You can see the, in this case, it's the darker um, sort of adobe looking colors there are the refugia. And so this is a concern. This is it, at least in the desert distribution of the species. And this is a species that occurs more coastally. And so it probably is quite secure there. But in the desert areas, this is probably a species that is at high risk of losing its distribution within the desert region. Um, this is a counterpart, the co um, desert horned lizard, and we can look at its current distribution. It occurs at the broad, um, low, level, low, low elevation areas of the desert. And when we do the shift, we can see that there are broad areas of refugia, again, these more adobe or brownish red colors. The new habitats in this case are kind of these pink colors. And this is a case where we wanted to do some validation. And so we said, okay, um, we know they occur here today. Where are they today? And, and one of the things that happened, as most of you are well aware, is we had three years of very severe drought here, which is if it's not related to climate change, it mimics what we expect climate change to look like. And so we started looking for them in all of these low elevation areas, and we have not been able to find them, any of them, in these low elevations this year. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily gone from those areas, but they're not active, they're not detectable. But we went into those areas that are the, this 
refugia areas, and we found them to be active and, and in fact reproducing in those areas, and even found in some of these areas that are projected to be future habitat, we, we went into this area and found population. Now, we don't know that that population is brand new, but they were high density, high reproducing populations, which was completely different from any place else we had seen. And it indicates that at least the model is identifying where the, the most um, productive and probably persistent populations are likely to be going forward. This is the um, western fence lizard, again, a more closely distributed species, but it also has desert populations. Here we see them. This is a slightly better scenario, but you can see that they're much reduced from within the park anyway. There are large areas of refugia down in this area, some new habitat at the high elevations here. But these refugia here are given opportunity to, for the park to focus their management. And in this case, it means both in the, from a Joshua tree standpoint and from this species standpoint to really control wildfire. And wildfire is not necessarily a, a native or natural process in the Mojave Desert, but it has become an increasingly severe stressor as a result of invasive grasses that have come in there. And um, that's exactly the, the area where the highest fire incidence is exactly where these refugia, both for the fence lizard and the Joshua trees, are here. And so it gives an opportunity to the National Park to focus their management at controlling these fires to maintain these refugia intact. Um, desert spiny lizard, um, we've got potentially two forms. This is the purple back form and the yellow back form up here that occur within the park. It's broadly distributed, um, large areas of um, refugia. So it's not a species, even though we're, they're going to lose a lot of their low elevation habitat, broad areas of refugia. And so these are areas that will be easy for the park to, and, uh, and outside areas and Bureau of Land Management lands. These lands up here are part of a, a marine base, and, and this is the National Monument down here. These are going to be well or easily protected refugia sites, and, and, and we anticipate that this species is probably going to do quite well, even though it's going to lose some of its low elevation habitat. Chuck wallows, we have two different um, ecotypes or, or, or morphological types in the southern area down here in the monument and Ansborough, we have a yellow-backed form, and then in the more northern part in Joshua Tree and, and further north and west, there's a red-backed form. They don't pass through the um, Coachella Valley at all. There's, this is a large sand dune area, and there's just no ability to get a, a chuckawalla from one end to the other, or one side or the other. This is a, a, another opportunity where we were able to do some biological validations. We were able to see that the model identified this area out here where we didn't have any points. We didn't even know they occurred there. We went out and looked for them, and we found them. And so the model actually showed us new areas to find the species. And you can see that those are areas um, both to the western edge and to the higher elevations where the species is likely to occur. And like the desert horned lizard, after three years of drought, we're not seeing them at any of the low elevation sites right now. Again, we don't know that that means that they're gone. It just means that they're not active. But at the middle and higher elevation sites, they're extremely active um, and reproducing, even in the, the third year of a drought. So it gives us another idea of where, how important these refugia sites are and, and that the model is, is heuristic in that it's telling us where to look for sustainable populations. Um, night lizards, this is the yucca night lizard right here. And we modeled its distribution even though we know it doesn't occur in this area. We have a different species down here, which is called Wiggins um, night lizard. And we're also seeing a separation between the monument and the populations down in Anzborego. And it turns out that although it hasn't been described, it, officially as a new species. Genetically, those two populations are quite different. So there's at least three different species of yucca-type night lizards in addition to the granite and the sandstone night lizards that I showed on a previous slide. This is a species that looks like, even though the vulnerability in the assessment said it looked pretty bad, this one doesn't look too bad. It's going to be pulled out of some of its lower elevation, but there's broad areas of refugium
Um, even the, so a lot of people associate this with um, Joshua trees, which they are, but they're also associated with all species of yucca. Um, and, and so we find, even with bunch grasses, we find them. And so this is probably a species that's going to do better than the um, vulnerability assessment suggested. At least there's a difference of opinion between the two modeling approaches. And so this is a, another reason that we need to go out and um, get empirical data and actually find out what's really going on on the ground. Tortoises, everybody's interested in tortoises. Um, this model might be a little confusing. It's two different models that are overlapped, and so the dark green is where the models overlap. We have a model for the southern area that we've been showing you so far, as well as a northern area that includes most of the 29 Palms Marine Base. So where this is, um, it's just the same thing. It's just overlapped in the way I wasn't able to make the two colors look the same when I overlapped them and still have them a little bit transparent so you can see the topography underneath. So today they occur broadly throughout the park, although not at the higher elevations, but much more broadly as you get into the Mojave Desert. The future habitat shows large areas of refugia up in here, as well as in the park, but large areas where they're not going to be able to occur and some new habitat areas up in these higher elevations. And, and so this is another opportunity to at least consider assisted migration. I'm not advocating it, but I'm at least suggesting that from a management standpoint, it's something to start thinking about. So you can see how the models work and, and the kind of information that we get from them. We can use those then to place monitoring stations and then across the park. And in this case, we have identified 27 monitoring stations that we want to sample over time to see whether or not these models are operating the way we, ex we at least the models are protect predicting. And within the 27, there's nine within this higher elevation area, which is this kind of yellow green. There's nine within the middle elevations are the transition zones, which are, is this um, maybe mint green or um, gray or green, and then another nine in the lowest elevations, which is this tan color. And we use the models to predict whether or not they occur at each of these stations currently, which would be a C, or in the future, which is F, or the current and the future, which is a refugium, and so that's the CF right there. And you can see that um, we have species out here that are the low elevation species or the low elevation species, and then the higher elevation species are on the right. So these are plants over here and reptiles over there. It gives you an idea of how we employed the models to guide us as to where we should be putting these monitoring stations so we can actually see changes over time and see transitions from one um, lower elevations to middle elevations to maybe even higher elevations over time. When we're talking about over time, we're probably talking decades, and decades becomes a problem when you're trying to implement a monitoring program, and how do you make that um, sustainable? And, and it, you know, especially in today's budgets, it's, you can say to your you know, supervisors, we need to do this and, the, and make a really good argument, and they say, hey, go ahead, but um, when you say we have to do this for 10 years or we have to do it for 30 or 40 or 50 years, it becomes less palatable. And so we thought about how we were going to do that. And what we came up with, and, it, and it's I, admittedly a little controversial, but it seems to be working pretty well, is to really embrace the idea of citizen scientists. And to do that gives the management unit, in this case the National Park, but it could be the National Monuments, it could be the um, any conservation unit or management unit, it gives them a lot of benefits. It, it has people that get engaged with the place, and so they become advocates for the park or for the monuments. They um, become more aware of the science and, and management issues, so they, they become informed and advocates for doing better management. And, and so this is a, a lot of benefit for the park, but it also, you know, Benefits are good for the park, and then these political or, or um, cultural benefits are good, but unless you're getting good, good data out of it, it doesn't make any sense. 
So we, we want to make sure that we're getting that kind of good data. We, these are just images of people both measuring Joshua trees and, and, and going out and looking for reptiles. Or, and then we do have some pitfall arrays, although that's not a big part of our um, design. They are already there, and so we use them to just have people get a chance to see some of the small mammals and reptiles and be able to get you know right up close to them. Um, so we, d we did an analysis to see whether or not using the citizen scientists made a difference over just putting two scientists out there and going to the plot. And these plots are pretty large. And they're large because they're supposed to accomplish a lot. It's not just to look at reptiles, it's to look at plants, um, Joshua trees, pinion pines, the whole nine yards of the biodiversity that occurs here. So in some cases we are looking at, um, or, or we compared, we took um, two National Park Service biological interns, people who have been trained or had prior knowledge on identifying animals, and, and in this case reptiles, and we said we'd go out to this plot. And then at a different time, either before or after, a week or two different, we went out with our citizen scientists. In those cases, the, we would have two or three biologists to help those um, citizen scientists. But there would be five, seven, and sometimes even more citizen scientists out there with us. And then we compare the results, and we had specific metrics that we were looking at. First, number of species, the number of focal species, which are those species we identified going into this that we thought would be important for us to track and the total numbers, because we want to see both in terms of species changes over time, but we want to be able to see changes in abundance over time and see if that makes a difference. And so you can see in every single metric we used, there were very statistically significant advantages to using the citizen scientists to just using a couple of biologists at a time. These are important results. We haven't done the next step yet because this was just this current year's worth of data. But the next step was to, would be to say, well, if you go once to this site, is that good enough, or do you need to go still multiple times to a given site before you have a really good list of what is there and a good idea of the total individuals? One of the other things that we do at this is that we also collect GPS points for every single observation we have, and so that feeds back into creating new um, habitat suitability models, and it also gives us an idea of within this relatively large 300 meter by 300 meter plot, whether there are portions of that or um, microhabitats that tend to be the focal areas for where these species are able to sustain themselves over time. So anyway. Um, when, um, this is Carol. I just wanted to. Um, let everybody know that since we were about 10 minutes uh, late starting, we'll, we'll go 10 minutes past the hour. And if anybody has to get off, um, I want to thank thank them for joining uh, today. Okay. Great. Well, um, although I, I see that you you wrote me a note there as I was talking, I was trying to talk very fast. So actually, actually very much the end of uh, my talk. These are um, this is the funding that we got to make this happen, both from the National Park Service and through the Fish and Wildlife Service. But I also wanted to point out that, again, getting to the sustainability aspect of this, we wrote a grant to Earthwatch. And if you're not familiar with Earthwatch, it's an international nonprofit organization that finds volunteers for you and sends them to you and, and actually funds you to um, take care of them for a week or two at a time. And we were able to get a Earthwatch grant for this next year. So in 2015, we'll have, assuming people sign up for it, they call them expeditions. So we'll have four separate ex week-long expeditions, which will have anywhere from six to 12 or 15 um, citizen science volunteers. And we, we anticipate, from a reptile standpoint, being able to survey almost all of those um, plots this coming year and be able to, to look at the entire distribution of whether or not we were able to, whether our modeling and what we anticipated the um, distribution occurrence of those species of those plots is in fact what we find on those plots. Um, so that's going to be one of the tasks that we're going to, we're looking forward to this 
to doing in 2015. Um, overall, we anticipate being able to do probably no more than about nine plots a year from both vegetation and reptile standpoint. And so every three to four or five years, we would then start over again and do, it, do them again and do them again and do them again. So by doing only a, a small portion of them on any given year, we hope to be able to, again, make this a sustainable effort and not um, something that we will only be able to do once and never again. And if, and if that is the outcome, then it really doesn't do us any good at all. We need to be able to have multiple years and in multiple decades of data before we can really see whether or not this is giving us the kind of information and either validating or informing our modeling so that we can improve those models in the future. So I put my um, name and my um, email address down here again. So again, I encourage you to email me if there are any of these papers that you would like more information um, or for me to send you the papers so you can have them and, and digest them again and we can have an ongoing dialogue about the information um, via email if you'd like. Anyway, that's all I have for this presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. So folks can unmute themselves, I think, with star six or type them into the chat. Make sure you send them to um, Cameron. I guess I had um, one question is that could could you overlay other taxa over these sample sites, or would you have to reanalyze, um, you know, go through the same analytical procedure that you did, all of this stuff? We could, um, at least with the habitat suitability models, all we need is um, a, a series of points where we know they occur today. And, and it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that in that the points need to be spatially distinct because of there's we can only use one point for one of these cells that I described that's 180 meters by 180 meters. So if you have 10 observations in one cell, like at a, one, a campground or at a parking lot where everybody sees that lizard or that bird at that point, um, we can only use one of those points. Um, so that the others are redundant. Um, and the models improve as you um, start getting points in the, the full distribution of the species. So if we only collect points in the one corner of their distribution, the models aren't very good. We need to be able to look at the broadest extent of their distribution. But once we have those points, and, and minimum of maybe 40 of these spatially independent points, and the more the better, we can put we can do this for any species. Once we have that base map, which we pro provided as part of this grant, we can do any species that um, is of interest to the managers or to the biologists, we can overlay that and, and get an idea of how that species looks both today and going future into a future climate change scenario. Hey, Cam, Rob Lovitch here. Can you hear me? I can. Right on, figuring out this uh, Cisco system. But I texted you. I was distracted for the granite sandstone uh, model. I don't know if you could flip back to that and give me the highlights real quick. Um, I'd be interested in seeing that. Um, we didn't model that species because there's not enough points to do that. Um, right. I can. I can just. Let's the, the granite, go back. maybe. Just curious. Yeah, since I've worked so much on, but. Um, that makes sense on the sandstone. I was interested to see how they were combined into uh, one model, so that answers that. So the, we didn't include any of the points, but as you know, because it's the species you've spent the most time with, um, they occur down in this corner down here. But it's a, yeah. um, at most, it would probably be a few dozen points, and that really wouldn't be enough to model the species well, sure. unless that's the only place it occurs. Um, so what we did model were the yucca night lizard group, which includes at least two and probably three different species. 
and so we didn't look at granites either. We just looked at the yucca night lizard group, and if we go to them, um, you can see they're, they occur broadly because they occur both with yucca shadigara or the Mojave yucca as well as um, Hespera yucca, which is the coastal yucca species. And, um, as well, and Joshua trees. And so they have a very broad distribution, broader than most people, I think, realize. And we've even been able to pick them up in bunch grasses, as um, even some invasive bunch grasses that we've been pulling as part of um, invasive species management within the, the monument area. And some of the volunteers pull up these bunch grasses and find the Wiggins type, or at least not the Wiggins type, but a a new type, which is is that um, occurs within the monument here, that seems to be disjunct from the ones down in Anza Borrego. I appreciate it. I guess I missed less than I thought. I was uh, enthused by the idea of seeing the um, the granite, but if you're working in J tree, uh, good reason why that yeah. would stall too. But I appreciate it. Thanks, Cam. Nice job. If we did have good um, geologic maps of the sandstone type where the sandstone night lizards occur, it'd probably be, it probably, I think it would come up with a really good model. Um, but yeah, you talk, we can talk offline about that. I've been poring over those for a decade or more now and trying to get better resolution. And um, you need a lot of site-specific geological information that I couldn't find with the California um, geologic maps just wasn't there, but um, that would be an interesting question to probe. It may indicate other populations, too. Yeah, uh, and actually that brings up a really important point, is um, the models are really limited by the GIS layers that we have available to us. And over time, the, the layers are becoming more and more um, precise, but even at that, um, they're not as good as as a, a biologist or a natural historian, you go out there and you say, well, this, this is the type of rock or this is the type of sandstone or the type of outcrop where we find this species. And they, for the most part, the model, the, the GIS layers aren't that precise. Um, in soils areas, like for instance, the Coachella Valley, because it has an agricultural history, the soils layers are incredibly finely, um, spatially, distinct and really, really accurate. And so when we're modeling things like uh, flat-tailed horn lizards or fringe-toed lizard, fringe lizards, we can get extremely precise maps that are really accurate. But when we go beyond these agricultural areas, the soils maps are just terrible. And it's it's like this is, you know, sand or, or silt and it's this percent or that, but they're not accurate at all. And we know that soils are important to these species, and, and, and the soils maps are just not what they need to be in some cases. But um, topography and slope faces and things like that tend to be very important to them as, as well. And the, the digital elevation models are quite accurate, and those are things that I th I'm really confident with. The climate models are they're extrapolations. They're models in themselves, and so they're not perfect and they're generally um, accurate or relatively accurate on the order of about one square kilometer, which is not terrible, but it's not great e either when you're stock talking about looking at 180 meters by 180 meter cells within that. Um, and so there are a lot of reasons to be suspect of the models. There's a lot of reasons to, to, um, to also understand that no model is perfect. There is no model in the world, no matter how well you constructed it, it's not perfect. And some of them are terrible, and some of them are good enough to give you insights on where to look and where, how to um, think about the species. And that's what I'm hoping that these models are. Are there any other questions? This is Linda Allison. I have a question. Hey, Linda. Um, so I'm not sure what the environmental variables are behind your models, but do climate change models for these areas show any precipitation differences between high and low elevation? I mean, when you look at some of these species moving or having refugia up 
at higher elevation, is that driven primarily by uh, temperature differentiation between the two areas, or what, why is it that they're finding refugia in the mountains? That's a great question. Um, and the climate, so if you look at temperature um, models for climate change, and um, I'm not a climatologist, so I, all I do is look at the models that are available. The temperature projections, there's maybe at this point somewhere between a dozen and two dozen different models that are used by the larger community of people that are doing these sorts of modeling efforts. And for temperature, they all agree. They always there. There's very little variance between what we expect to happen. For precipitation, it's very. There's variation all over the place. There is some of the models say it's definitely going to get drier. Some people, some of the models say, eh, it's not going to change so much. Some people say, well, winter rain's going to change and get drier, but summer rain's going to stay the same or get more. And so there isn't agreement between the models at this point. And so we specifically did not include precipitation in the model. And that is a that's a, that's a concern because any of us who know these species know that um, precipitation is what drives resources, and resources is what drives where these species can occur. And most of them can handle hot temperatures. They're desert animals. They, they can handle that, desert plants or animals, but they can't handle five years of drought or six or seven years of drought, that becomes really a problematic um, event from them, from their standpoint. What we did find is that looking at current conditions and looking at that summer um, maximum temperature, which is the variable that we use is because we figured that was the most stressful for the both the plants and the animals, was the mean maximum summer temperature. If we then looked at precipitation, there was almost a one-to-one -one correspondence or a, a correlation value of 0.9 something or other um, between precipitation and um, the temperature. And so if we assume that that relationship is going to stay the same, we don't know that for sure, but if we assume that as it gets warmer, it gets drier, and that's what most of the models seem to be suggesting for arid areas. As it gets warmer, it's going to get drier. That that relationship, if it doesn't stay the same, it's probably going to not be that different. And so we think that um, temperature creates a proxy for precipitation. It's an assumption that needs to be tested over time. And one of the things that I didn't include um, was that within Joshua Tree, and, and hopefully as we expand this to other sites, we're including climate stations, hobo stations, remote stations, so we're going to actually be able to measure the on-site climate changes that occur over time. But that's a great question, and, and it, it's one of the shortcomings of this kind of modeling effort. And, and it's why it's so important not to just depend on the models, to use the models as a heuristic guide, but to get out there and measure things on the ground. And that's why I'm stressing that the, the, the actual monitoring or long-term um, research, and when, when you talk in the university, this is all long-term research. When I talk to managers, it's monitoring, but it's the same thing. Um, this is a critical aspect of this if we're going to truly understand what's happening here. So just as a follow-up, so you're, I guess I'm surprised that at this relatively local scale that um, Precipitation in Joshua Tree Highlands is higher than in the lowlands. I have always assumed in the desert that there was less differentiation between high and low elevation than in other, let's say, temperate areas. It's it's quite distinct, and, huh. and even in this um, middle of this drought, at areas in the higher or middle elevations, there were flowers in Joshua Tree this last couple of years, whereas in the low elevations. There hasn't been a flower there for three years, or an annual plant, um, and so there is a predictable higher intensity of drought at the lower elevation, and a predictable lower intensity of drought at the middle and higher elevations. But is it, so? But drought is also affected by temperature, the the drought metrics, right? Right, and so what I was trying to say is that there is a high correlation between temperature and drought climate-wise. Now.
Um, when I do talks on climate change to folks who aren't scientists, I always stop and say, okay, there's a difference between weather and science, or in weather and climate. Weather is what happened this year, what happened today, what happened the last two or three years. Climate is what happens over decades. And so we can generalize over decades. We can't generalize over today and tomorrow or, or a year or two. And so it's important to make those distinctions, but over those decadal generalizations, um, there is a higher predictability of rainfall at the higher elevations and less severity of drought and vice versa for the lower elevations. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I want to thank um, Cameron Barrows for a great uh, webinar and we believe that it was recorded, so we hope we can have that on the um, Desert LCC uh, YouTube channel. And I want to thank uh, Victoria for helping out with with all the technical aspects and everyone for participating. Uh, I think that we're going to try to get some of those papers um, put on the Google Drive that we've been using for our our um, uh, Desert LTC critical ma management question. So uh, we'll be getting in touch with you about that. So uh, thank you, everyone, and thanks for participating. Thank you.